promptly at 1215. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Please feel free to submit questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A pod on the right hand corner of your screen. Uh, we'll get to as many questions as we possibly can at the end of the webinar. Also, there are files available for download if you'd like some uh, information about today's webinar. The first is the uh, presentation slides. The second is an information brochure about cyber services. And the third is an article on risk transference and and organizational assurance. And we'll talk a little bit more about these as we go through the program. The easiest way to download them is to click on the three dots in the upper right hand corner of the files pod and click download all. Just a reminder, this webinar is not being offered for CME. And so um, sit back and enjoy the webinar. We'll get started. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Cyber Insurance, a Risk Strategy. As daunting as that title sounds, we will try to spice it up just a little bit by adding some actual cyber incidents uh, to make it a little more exciting along the way. I'm Kathy Bryant, the manager of TMLT Cyber Consulting Services. In addition to cyber consulting, my team also facilitates the pur purchase of cyber insurance with higher limits through uh, for TMLT policyholders. All of the TMLT and LSA professional medical liability policies have cyber insurance coverage endorsed to their policies. Those cyber incidents and claims are managed by Amtrust. The higher limits policies are also issued by Amtrust. So it is with my great pleasure that I tell you that joining me today is Linda Comfort. She is an Assistant Vice President of Claims and Cyber Incidents at Amtrust. Linda has been working in the cyber claims arena since 2015. Uh, both on the forensic side and extensive experience in helping policyholders working through their immediate needs after a cyber incident. Our intention today is not to really focus on any particular cyber insurance policy, although many of the things that we'll be referencing are specific to TMLT and LSA policyholders. In my experience, people really do not understand their cyber insurance coverage. It's not like the auto insurance policy that you probably have had since you got your driver's license. The cyber is still relatively new in the world of uh, insurance. So, I think there are some key things that will help us understand cyber insurance a little better. So Linda, can you really, can you explain the intent of a cyber policy? Sure, Kathy, no problem. The importance of a cyber insurance policy is really, it's a transfer of risk. It's a risk transfer strategy. So one way to think about cyber insurance is that it is not just an if you have an incident, it's when you have a privacy or security incident, you now have the assistance that you need to walk through this process and make it a lot less stressful. So that's what I would think of as, you know, what is cyber insurance and how does it help? It helps when you're stressed and you're not sure what's going on with your computer system to get you in the hands of the right vendors and help you with the cost that definitely will come from such an event. One of the real challenges with cyber insurance is there really is a lack of standardization of coverage and even definitions within the industry. Any thoughts or tips on uh, understanding cyber coverage? 
It definitely feels like a foreign language, right? Because there are so many technical terms that get tossed around. And when you're looking at policies and you're trying to compare apples to apples, it might be very confusing. So in my experience with claims, I've worked for a lot of different carriers and a third party administrator. So I've seen many policies and it really is all about reading the terms and understanding the definitions, right? Because one policy might call it a ransom payment. Another policy might call it an extortion payment. And those two are pretty straightforward and interchangeable. But it gets a little more convoluted when you're looking at a fraudulent funds transfer, which can also be called a misdirected payment. And there becomes a lot of questions when it when it gets down to how do we interpret that at the policy we're looking at? You know, what does my company really need? What are the risks that my company has? Great. Thanks, Linda. Some of the most common things that we see reported as cyber incidents today are phishing attacks, ransom attacks, email compromise, fraudulent funds transfer, and generally some IT issues. So we're going to spend a little bit of time going through um, each of these as we go through the webinar today. Again, we didn't want to really focus on any particular policy or coverage, but just as Linda had pointed out, uh, there are some, some terms that you may or may not have been familiar with. Um, there are differences in coverage in the embedded or endorsed policy and the buyout policy. And the three that we have circled here um, are only on the, the buyout policy. But Linda, just for a general starting point, would you like to cover first and third party losses and, and what the difference is? Sure, not a problem. So it gets a little confusing when someone hears first party versus a third party claim. To break it down and make it a little more digestible, I like to think of a first party claim as the insured is bringing the claim to the insurer. So for example, the doctor's office might have a computer system that's hit with ransomware. The insured is the one with the problem who is now bringing it to the carrier to get help. So that's first party. They are the first party bringing it to us. When it comes to third party, that is um, commonly more when we're seeing lawsuits, right? So an outside party is bringing forward a demand, usually to the insured, right? So say there is a doctor's office, doctor's office where the patient's information is exposed on accident inadvertently and that patient is now coming to the doctor's office and suing or demanding funds for damages that they believe that they have right so that demand is then brought to the carrier by the insured saying hey we have someone else who is making a demand of us and then we would be looking at that so cyber insurance is unique in that there is first and third party coverage for certain incidents and um the endorsement is great. It is a solid addition to your med mal and anything else that you're going to need insurance for. But that buy up is going to give you that additional pieces of, you know, your interruption on your suppliers and or your cyber deception, your crypto jacking. It gives you a few more layers of additional assistance as well as a higher limit. So some of the businesses, when you're looking at you know, how much coverage do we need? That's when it really comes into play to say, does this buy it make sense for us? You know, what do we think our risk might be? And the answer usually is yes, it sounds great. So as I said earlier, phishing is one of those most commonly reported incidents. Would you like to, uh, Tell us a little bit about what you're seeing with phishing attacks, Linda. Sure, not a problem. We typically see several different events come through on the policies. One of the most common ones is a business email compromise stemming from a phishing attack. So phishing is a fraudulent practice of, you know, a threat actor is sending emails pretending to be a reputable company 
in order to try and fool people into providing passwords, credit card numbers, information that they can then monetize. So it's very, very common. We see it weekly, daily. It is a huge problem in today's world, that's for sure. Well, and unfortunately, often those phishing attacks are kind of the the lead into a ransomware attack or a ransom demand. Mm -hmm. Tell me um, what a policyholder could expect if they report a ransom demand with, um, with their policy and how you as uh, someone with AmTrust claims would respond. Not a problem. So ransomware can come from a couple different angles. As Kathy's saying, email compromise can be, um, you know, one way where they get in the system, they get your password, they look around and um, gain access to the system, right? Um, when it comes to ransomware, the first thought is, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Who do I go to? What happens next? Ideally, call us right away. It's really important to get us in to help you right off the bat. So a ransomware attack might hit on a Friday. Everyone comes in on Monday and notices, oh no, I can't access my computer. We're going to see usually people trying to handle it on their own or they're going to report it immediately to TMLT, to Kathy and the team over there. And they will gather the initial details, which they'll send to the AmTrust team to provide the claims handling side. So once we have the policy and we're taking a look, we're going to call you within minutes of getting that notice. So it could be any time. It could be on a weekend. It could be after hours. We're here to support and get you the right help that you need. So once you make that call to TMLT, they provide it to us. And we also have a hotline too, you know, if you're worried about after hours. And then we're going to reach out immediately. We're going to have that initial call with the insured and gather, you know, what's gone on, what's the problem, can you tell us a little bit more. And based on the information that we're provided, we're able to make a determination of what vendors do we need to get in touch with to best assist with the situation. Part of the benefit of having your coverage is we have vetted vendors who deal with this day in, day out that we work with. And not only do we have faith in what they're doing and that it's in your best interests, we also know that there is a reduced rate. So the cost of you going off the street to some of these vendors is generally going to be higher. And they might also add in things that you might not necessarily need done. So we're able to use our critical eye and help manage the situation with you to make sure that you're getting what you need and that things are timely and that the costs are going to be something you're aware of, of whether or not there's coverage for. So once that claim comes in, we've already talked, we've gathered the details, we set up what's called a scoping call with our vendors and we're going to have you and the forensic firm and privacy counsel as well as your IT, all on one call to sort of talk through the details and get an estimated estimated budget of what is this going to look like at this point in time? What do we think we're looking at cost-wise? So it gets us some control on moving forward, getting our EDR or Sentinel-1 or whatever it happens to be deployed to help with protecting your system. So as you're trying to recover, you're going to have some protection as well as guidance as you're getting back to operational. You know, they're going to be helping you troubleshoot with, are there any backups? You know, is there anything we can recover from helping with prioritizing to make sure that your business is getting back to operational as quickly as possible? So it's definitely a team effort and we all work together. I'm going to be on those calls with you and I'm there for any questions or concerns along the way. So it's a lot that that's happening and it's very stressful for someone who's never been through it. And the positive is that you have us to be there to hold your hand throughout the process because we have seen it, we have been there and we wanna help you get back to where you were as quickly as we can. I think that's a great summary. I mean, I even know of a practice that discovered ransomware late in the day on a Friday and they had that scoping call within 
an hour or two so that they didn't lose the weekend, which, mm -hmm. especially with a ransom attack, is extremely critical. Definitely. This slide just is to help remind you all that if you are a TMLT policyholder, reporting a claim is very straightforward. You simply call our 800 number, and typically one of our claims techs will actually be the ones taking the call. Although I can tell you that if my team or anyone at TMLT got a call uh, saying they had ransomware, we know exactly who we need to get that call to. We can help you with other things later, but at that moment, the call needs to go to claims so that it can go through the process and get to Linda and her team very quickly. Um, and that we just add, this is actually from our website, but we add the caution that we so often put in is do not allow your IT to erase or wipe any servers or hard drives in an effort to begin data recovery mm -hmm. because this can destroy valuable evidence that sometimes may come down to do I have to report this incident to the OCR or do I have forensic evidence that shows that the data was not compromised? Uh, and I'll, the I'll touch on that. Protected health Absolutely. information. For, for sure. You are like spot on right there. You know, the common issue I, I hear people say is I don't have the time to notify. They're in a panic and they're just dealing with it. If you have an emergency, are you going to call 911 when you have an emergency or you're going to say, I didn't have time to call 911? We are there to be your 911. We are here to help you apply pressure to the wound and make sure that you're getting the medical attention that you need, right? So it's really important to right away report. Even if you're in doubt and you just have questions, we're here to answer them. We want to be there to help you make the right choices for your business. And when it comes to wiping evidence, Sometimes people are in a panic to get back to operational and they've never dealt with this before. Your IT may never have seen ransomware, or even if they did, they might not understand the implications of not being able to know what has happened to that data. And part of the intent of this policy is to help with that. It is, we are here to find out how did the threat actor get in? What did they do while they were there? And what are our reporting obligations in light of this incident? And we really want to make sure that we're not deleting evidence. Even if you're getting back to operational, we want to make a copy of whatever devices have been encrypted or whatever we need to look at. Because what if we don't need to notify? That would be a lot better than being able to say, well, we don't have any evidence, so now we have to notify. And notification can get very costly. So it's in your best interest to report it and make sure we're there to help you decide, okay, how do we make copies? What are we making copies of? And what does that mean for an investigation and ideally uh, reducing that potential risk of notification? So. so we touched on this just briefly, but there's this whole new um, cyber incident that is emerging secondary to email compromise and fraudulent funds transfer. Like you said, there's lots of other terms that float around out there. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing with cyber or with, I'm sorry, with email compromise and also, unfortunately, the fraudulent funds transfer? Sure. So I think that when we think of a fraudulent funds transfer, people might not understand that a lot of the time it comes out of a spoofed email or a fake email, or someone might have access to someone's email, be that your company's email or another party you do business with. There's still a major issue here, right? Because, you know, one example of a common threat actor activity would be your company, your employee is emailing with, say, a known person, right? Say your doctor, who the doctor has emailed your employee saying, hey, change my bank account for payroll next month. Um, you know, 
I had some changes in my bank change. Please change my banking info. Now, the problem with that is if that's not verified with that doctor and it wasn't that doctor, no, but it was from the doctor's known email, you might now have your employee being tricked into changing the banking information to a threat actor's information. So I've seen $160,000 misdirected for one month's payroll when an employee thought they were talking to someone they knew and it turned out to be a threat actor. So picking up the phone and double checking with them before changing any banking information is really important. And the other thing you'll often see is sometimes these threat actors are in their inbox for a little while seeing who they talk to about money and they're kind of getting a feel for how to talk like that person. And they also might even use that knowledge to, you know, use the proper subject line, use the proper wording. And it can be very easy to be fooled because they're that crafty. And people don't realize how common it is for that error to be made. Another example would be your office has a vendor that you work with regularly and that vendor sends an email saying, oh, I need you to urgently pay this invoice. I need it paid today. I need it paid this week. Let me know when you've transferred the funds. And this might be an invoice that you'd been sitting on for a little while or, you know, might just happen to have been in an inbox. And lo and behold, the employee doesn't double check. They just try to transfer the million dollars to pay this vendor for goods or services. And the next thing you know, it's to that wrong bank account, right? It's sent to a changed bank account that they're saying, hey, send this right away. Do it really quick. They want you to take action before you have time to think. And quite often, anytime anyone's emailing you to make a payment or an employee to make a payment and they're talking about urgency or they're making a change, take take a minute, stop, think about it, pick up the phone to a known phone number, not the phone number in the email, because they often will change that, and give them a call. Try and find out, do I actually need to transfer these funds or not? Because I have seen $10 million transferred to the wrong person, a million dollars. Sometimes you get some money back, and sometimes all of the money is gone. So it's really important for employees and staff to take a minute double check before they ever transfer funds. Yeah, I think there were some really good points in there, Linda. I think uh, I just want to come back and reiterate on the one that you talked about. Not only is it best practice for an, a company to have a written policy and procedure in place that if they get um uh, wiring instructions for an electronic funds transfer that an essential part of that process is that they pick up the phone and call and verify that that is the correct wiring instruction because mm -hmm. so many of these that we're seeing I think Kathy got kicked out, but so many of these that we're seeing definitely could have been avoided if, in fact, the threat actor had been caught before the money was sent. All right, there you are, Kathy. Hi. I'm not sure what happened there, but thanks for keeping that conversation going, Linda. <laughs> no problem. Unfortunately, another one that we... Uh, type of incident that we often hear about are issues that a practice feels like they are just um, being really wronged, if you will. You know, they've gone out, they've done their due diligence, they've tried to hire good IT support, whether mm -hmm. that's a um, managed service provider, managed service security provider, there's all sorts of different terms and levels of, of, of uh, work that companies will do for practices now, only to find out after an incident occurs that something wasn't being maintained correctly. Uh, do you have any 
thoughts or not thoughts, but can you tell us what, how you all handle those claims? Because sure. really the practice is a sort of a double victim. They're a victim of whatever the cyber threat was, but they're also a victim of not being their, comp their IT not keeping up. Definitely. And it's something that we have seen, you know, very commonly I'll see where a company is paying a managed service provider to maintain their backup and no one has checked that backup in maybe the last five years. And so after a ransomware hit, they were like, oh, we're fine. We have our backup. Well, they go back to that company who's managing it and being paid to manage it. And they're like, hey, we need our backups now. And they're like, um, actually, we don't have it for the last four years so sorry. But now where does that leave the company, right? So the carrier and the insurance policy is not there to point fingers and say, oh no, you know, your IT didn't do their job, so we're not paying it. That's not at all what happens. What happens is we say, okay, what's the situation? What happened? Where are we at? And how do we recover from that, right? Our concern isn't that your IT didn't do their job. It is how do we get you back to operational? How do we get you where you need to be? And what does that mean, right? The intent isn't to say, you know, oh, your IT didn't do their job. Now we're not paying for anything. It's to say, okay, this happened. Mistakes were made. Now what do we do? And I've seen it happen again and again. It's very common. Not only is it open RDP ports, sometimes it is even... Um, patching that was supposed to be done wasn't done properly or hasn't been maintained, thus leaving a vulnerability. That has been very common in the past year and led to a lot of ransomware claims. And all of them, all of them were paid out, right? So when the when the IT didn't patch from the zero day event, then the next thing you know, threat actors are are exploiting that back door and they're in the system off the Microsoft Exchange server and then bam, ransomware. And this happened again and again and again last year and into this year. So it's something we commonly see, Kathy. And like you said, our intent is to be there to help them get, get back to operational. It's not to judge them based on what's happened. Sure. And they really need to maintain that relationship mm -hmm. with that vendor, at least for the immediate post-incident period, because those that vendor is going to have valuable knowledge as well. And we so, often work with them. Yeah. Yeah. So Off, you know, maybe you find out somebody didn't do something. Your first knee-jerk reaction is, let's fire them. Let's replace them. And that certainly can be done, but it's probably not good to do that first step out of the, the situation? Definitely situation to situation, it depends. Quite often what we see is after the forensic analysis of what went on and you know what were the results, sometimes it's a failure that was out of their control. Other times it was clearly negligence. And so you know it's up to the insured on what they want to do after the fact. But quite often during the event, they're still relying on these relationships that they've had for the last 40 years, 20 years, five years, whatever it might be to get through the incident because who knows your network best, those who have been working on it and those who have maybe stood it up in the first place. So quite often, you know, the forensic team, the original IT team, privacy council and myself, along with the insured are all working as a team to get things back where they need to be. I know that a lot of practices have gone to, um, EHRs or EMRs mm -hmm. that are in the cloud or are web-based. And so the backup then becomes the responsibility of that vendor. Mm -hmm. However, if you think about it, there's a lot of other business records that aren't going to necessarily be in the EHR. Payroll is a great example. And I think that's um, another one of those areas that it's really important to have backups off the, your network somewhere that mm -hmm. if you had to go back and recreate records that that they uh, that you have a backup. Definitely. Segmenting the network is huge. So 
what that means is a lot of the time, especially in smaller offices, they'll have what's called a pancake network network where everything is attached, everything is connected. When you have a segmented network, if someone gets in via one computer, they might not have access to everything or to every server, right? Because things are separated. And that can really save a business when it comes to, you know, the remote EHR or EMR. Having those patient records separate from the rest of the network can be really key. If they're encrypted at rest, you're already reducing your risk of need to notify. Now, if you're also saying, well, but our employee data is kept on our server and everyone has access to it, then it's easy for a threat actor to say, well, we might not have gotten your patient information, but we did get your employee information and we're gonna sell their social security numbers online on the dark web. So you kinda don't want that to happen. I don't know about you, but I'd be pretty upset if my employer had my social security number out there. So I think it's really important that we do everything we can to encrypt at rest, bare minimum. And then secondly, try to keep your um, backups off the system and air gapped even if you have an on-site backup, like double backups, definitely I have seen save businesses thousands and thousands of dollars. So I, I think it's no surprise to uh, practices that the cost of cyber insurance has gone up dramatically. I would say that in the last two years, especially we've seen just a, a very dramatic increase. I believe that most of this is in response to the number of cyber threats that are out there. The fact that health um, health practices or healthcare in general is considered low hanging fruit mm -hmm. because maybe our technology hasn't kept up with the same levels of cybersecurity as say the banking industry. Mm -hmm. Um, plus we have to just be real honest, the number of claims continues to increase. Do you have any other thoughts about, about the correlation between rising costs and, and a cause of, uh, effect? Definitely. I, I think of it as first when cyber insurance came out, there were a lot less offerings, a lot fewer offerings that were available. It was pretty basic. As cyber has grown, the understanding of what offerings there are out there has grown as well, right? Before, maybe it was just for uh, bricking or for data uh, being unavailable. Then ransomware started becoming an issue. So then you started seeing cyber extortion and ransom demands and encrypted data and data recovery. Then you also started seeing email compromise. So you have added now the misdirected funds, the um, email compromise response. So all of these sort of things have evolved cyber insurance to cover a lot more than it ever did before. And the more that we see companies using technology, the more costly these claims are going to be because more people are using the technology. And not just using technology, but they have specific technology that they're using. So one of the biggest things is that specialty software can really be very costly. Law firms, a lot that I've worked with, have very costly claims because they have several different pr proprietary softwares that all have to communicate and work together that require specialists to come in to get it back to operational. And I've even seen this with hospitals, when you're talking about an MIR, MRI machine, um, your x-rays, your ultrasounds, all of these equipments are very specialized. And if they're operating on maybe an older computer that you're using to store information on, that's a vulnerable computer. But this is a key piece of the hospital. You really need these for analyzing patients and knowing what needs to happen next. So when that's down, it is really difficult on a hospital and they need to get it back to operational, which can a lot of the times require specialists to get it back to operational. So we've seen an increase in the cost of claims, which also leads to an increase in the need for the premiums because they're paying out a lot more. So where does that money come from? We all spread the risk, right? And I think that frequency and severity is another huge factor, right? I think of it like when there are a lot of fires one year. I live in California, so 
I have seen my auto insurance rise dramatically in years that we've had a lot of fires in our area because now there's a lot of risk that has increased and the carrier needs to spread that out. So that's part of how they mitigate that risk, right? So it's pretty common. And I think that as we've seen it be used more and more, cyber insurance has gone up. Yes. Well, we don't want to end on such a negative note. We wanted to try to add a little bit of a positive uh, ending. There are cyber risk management, cyber risk management strategies that you can do proactively in order to help protect your network and your practice from having to get that call from Linda after you've had a cyber incident. Uh, even though she, she's great to talk to and wonderful to work with, we want you to be in the best possible pr protection uh, so that you don't have to have those cyber incidents reported. Um, as many of you know, TMLT has offered cyber consulting services for several years now, and we continue to answer questions on a daily basis, as well as work with um, TMLT policyholders and non-policyholders for that matter uh, on their HIPAA compliance and cybersecurity. There are some proactive services that AmTrust does offer. So these would be available to all TMLT policyholders, uh, whether they have the embedded or the endorsement on their MedMal policy or whether they have the buy-up. And the first one is a free vulnerability scan of your network. Now these aren't uh, penetration testing or penetration tests. They're not going to come in and take over your network. They're not going to knock out your network. They're not going to slow the process down, um, you know, so that it could be done while you're conducting a clinic session or clinic hours, but they are going to look for external vulnerabilities that could be a risk to your network and to your practice. Yeah, they'll be looking for that low hanging fruit or the really obvious things because the biggest favor you can do your own business and yourself is to just like with a burglary, reduce your risk, you know, have the security cameras out, you know, make sure you've got your dog to bark and put up fences, right? There are certain things we do to protect our business, the same you would protect your home. And I think of all these free offerings as great opportunities to reduce your risk and get some insight and some help because I wouldn't know what I know about cyber if I weren't in cyber. So I think that a lot of these opportunities are getting you in touch with some experts for free that can help you to increase, you know, your security posture, or if you have questions or your IT team has questions, you can all sort of have a powwow, right? So meeting with the cybersecurity experts is really a great opportunity to have an hour of sit down time to say, you know what, we don't know what an incident response plan is. Can you give us a little bit of help here? Or we tried to fill this one out and develop it. Can you um, bounce back some ideas for us? Or maybe it's, we're struggling with considering one firewall versus another. Like, do you guys have any insight on firewalls or advice? It's, it's an hour of time that you can spend sort of talk through some of your questions that you and your IT team might have. And, you know, it can be a big benefit. Absolutely. And um, again, I would reiterate that the, the way to get to those services is simply the cyber at tmlt.org. You can just say, hey, I have questions about the proactive services or I want to schedule a vulnerability scan. And that just starts the process in motion. We've tried to make it extremely simple. There's not a bunch of different emails you have to remember for different things. Simply uh, emailing cyber at tmlt.org will get the process going. Mm -hmm. And having those phishing, you know, to train and educate your employees about phishing, it's like an hour. That's great. 
because like we said, human error is very common. It's typically one of the easiest ways for threat actors is to trick people. So by raising employee awareness, it might make them think twice or ask a question instead of just click on something that will then lead to an event. And it's worth your time as well as theirs. Great. Well, um, that's going to wrap up the webinar other than we do have time for some questions. Um, I am not seeing any questions in the Q&A pod at this moment, but we'll give you a minute or two to add some questions at this point. Uh, just a reminder that you can download the presentation, the uh, cyber services flyer and the article that we talked about by uh, clicking on uh, the download file. The article, um, it also has some great cybersecurity ideas in it and tips. Uh, it's from uh, an organization who, whose purpose is to create best practices for um, cybersecurity, specifically for medical practices. So you might want to take a look at that as well. Um, Cassie, I'm still not seeing any questions in the Q&A pod. Not seeing anything just yet, Kathy. I am, um, I'm thinking everybody wants to wrap up early and get back to work. <laughs> Oh, here, here's a quick question. I'm guessing they're going to type in the question. We just see the portion that says quick question. Any provider with TML uh, T policy automatically get cyber insurance? Yes, that is correct. All TMLT policy, medical malpractice policies, have an endorsement for cyber insurance on them. Great, thank you, Kathy. We'll leave it here for a couple of minutes, or a couple, one minute, and see if anyone else has any other questions. Um, recommendations for an IT vendor. That one's difficult, as big as Texas is. Um, you know, it really, IT vendors really need to be more geographic. Probably the best way to find out the, uh, IT vendors that have worked well with medical practices is to talk to colleagues and find out who they've had success with. Um, you know, if it's, post-incident, then maybe the forensics firm or some of the other uh, companies that Amtrust might be putting you in touch with might have some suggestions. But, um, you know, we have we've looked and toyed with vetting cyber or vetting IT vendors, and it's just really not possible in the state of Texas there would be so many different ones we would have to vet as well as the fact that we could vet them today and they could go out of business tomorrow so mm -hmm. well it looks like that might be all of the questions for now kathy and linda well thank you cassie for jumping in to moderate the last four questions um just a reminder, if you come up with a question that you want to ask, cyber at tmlt.org, email those. If it's appropriate for Linda, I'll share, send those on to her. Um, or otherwise, we'll try to get those questions answered for you as soon as possible. Thank you for joining us today. And we look forward uh, to seeing everyone next month. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, Kathy, for having me on. Thanks, Linda. <laughs> Bye.